results of a dissertation that was done at St. Mary's College in Northern California. It was a comprehensive study, and I'll be going over all the details. Committee members of this, this is the chair, uh, Professor uh, Swako, Larry Hoeklander, uh, interesting gentleman, he runs ConnectEd, and they, they put the CTE programs in the high schools. Uh, so, different uh, realm, and then uh, Barry Eckenhaus, he's basically created the St. Mary's MBA program for the online. So, kind of diverse backgrounds for these uh, gentlemen. And the abstract of this study, we'll go over what's going to happen here. The abstract, this term hyperblended learning, theoretical framework behind this study, uh, the actual experiment uh, results, and then uh, some discussion. And, and please feel free to interject at any point. Uh, the abstract, which is basically the summary of, of, of what happened here. The study was looking at the achievement, engagement, preference, and also the lesson development of a classroom teacher creating a home uh, multimedia instruction. Uh, Two-group experimental with a pre-test, post-test, uh, measuring and also an engagement, so it's a mixed methods. Uh, so we had quantitative and qualitative uh, data. And the results were that the students actually showed significant gains in their academic achievement, and they also show um, increased levels of engagement than the students in a live lecture. And I'll be going over this in a little bit more detail. Uh, the other thing was that the teacher ended up using the technology for lesson development and then collaboration with another teacher. So that has a lot of implications also. Uh, I'm going to talk about hyper blended learning. So if you want to go ahead and look at reform measures, um, you know, we were, we were listening this afternoon, uh, Mike over lunch was talking about technology. and um, You know, there's been a lot of different technologies, right? So. And I said the motion picture, you really believe that was going to replace type of books. Uh, radio, same deal. Uh, finest teachers were going to uh, hit every student. And then the television. And then the computers. People think that uh, one on one computing is, is new. Um, they've been doing one on one computing since the 60s and, and uh, through the 90s with actually not a lot of success. Uh, it's been, been really good to be an achievable goal with instructional technology. Um, so let me look at what's going on today with online learning. You know, initially referred to as correspondence learning. It grew out of that, um, and the whole idea that it's a mediated form. And then we looked at, you know, really pretty recently, um, using it through the internet as opposed to the U.S. Postal Service, right? And or PBS. PBS. Do you remember you had to turn tune into a yeah. A channel at a certain time to right. watch your class. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> they still do that. All right, so let's look at live lecture. Um, so one of the technology, you talk about technology, believe it or not, the chalkboard, that board in the front, is one of the oldest technologies that's still there. Uh, it's actually 1801 um, slate and uh, uh, calcium sulfide chalk, right? And it really did change the way that teaching was done. It's hard to appreciate how instruction was done prior to that. But once that happened, we're still living in that legacy of, of that chalk room stage at the front of the classroom. It really comes from this uh, chalkboard. Um, let's look at online learning, right? So I'm, I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, but asynchronous, uh, control of own pacing, flexibility anytime and anywhere. Um, but believe it or not, there's not a lot of research. Now, if you ask them, they'll tell you that it works. But if you look at empirical studies, there's not a lot of research that shows whether it helps or hinders uh, learning in the K-12 environment. Um, you might be surprised, but there's, there's very little. Yes. All right, so let's look at online versus face-to-face, -face, right? So one of the problems with the online is that there are schools that they just do online, for-profit schools, and they're actually, their API scores of achievement is lower than traditional high schools, which is a big surprise. People assume a whole online school is going to do outperform regular, but it doesn't. Now, some of the reasons for this is there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, when you look at instruction, multimedia instruction, which, which can be delivered online, um, you know, in, in the college level, it's a different animal. But when you look at K-12, especially high school students, one of the, and I'll talk about this in the theoretical framework, when, when you deal with multimedia online instruction, you're really dealing with what's called working memory. And uh, high school students, are, are that is part of the brain that is still being developed. So the reality is that maybe it works for the college level, but the data shows it really isn't working for the K-12. Uh, and, and 
so the speculation is that uh, the, the brain is just not at the same level as an adult learner, which, which makes sense if, if you've ever taught in high school uh, or in the 12th environment, right? Um, and so the interesting thing about that is if you are then taking online instruction based on data for college students, you're essentially not factoring in what we call um, human cognition, right? So if you're not factoring that in, it's probably going to be ineffective. Because if you're just assuming that you can do what works for college students and do it online for high school students or elementary school students, you are missing the boat here, right? So there is research that talks about this, and we'll get into that in a little bit. So blended learning, right? So if you look at the US Department of Education, uh, some will study here that they're saying that uh, blended has a better, does outperforms. This is a meta-analysis looking at a lot of different studies. Um, larger than face-to-face than -face and purely online. So this was 2009. So even then, they realized that you know there needed to be this thing called blended learning. Um, interesting thing about this is if you look at blended learning, people have a lot of definitions. It's kind of like your your gasoline in a car, right? You have different levels of uh, ethanol or whatever you're using. But blended learning typically refers to 30 to 79 percent of instructional content that's delivered all online. So. It's important to look at this word instructional content, right? If you're teaching in a class, is a worksheet instructional content, right? So if you ask a teacher, is a worksheet instruction, more than likely they're going to say no. So essentially, if you're just taking a, uh, a stagnant, not a dynamic instruction and putting it online, um, you are not necessarily doing blended learning, right? So think of, think of like a learning management system. You, you can buy these as, as kind of the tablecloth. Right? And the actual instruction is the multimedia, right? So just having something online is not instruction. It's just a place for people to learn. So, so then we deal with what is it that the actual students need to learn. All right, so let's, let's look at blended learning. Um, these are, are, are pretty tried and true definitions, combining the best of both instructional methodologies. Um, the thing about uh, most computer efforts and the way that it's used in the classroom today is that most blended learning supports a teacher's live instruction or the content, right? So typically, a teacher will say, I'm doing blended learning. I will teach the way that I regularly teach. And then we'll go online and do activities that support that, right? So that's not what we're talking about in this study. What we're talking about is actual uh, a cognitive tool, which is meaning that the instruction is done in an online format. So, so all that other stuff where they're going online and playing games and, and reinforcing, that's not what uh, multimedia instruction is. Um, so it is the primary form of content delivery. All right, so let's look at uh, blending versus online. Um, and, and I say this you know, carefully, but when you want to look at most improvement efforts, they, they, if you look at uh, Cuban, what he says here, it disregards the role of the classroom teacher. Typically, they're dropped in to a school, uh, IT or whomever, maybe a third party making these things. And the reason why that's significant is, uh, this is a researcher out of the uh, University of Michigan, uh, the NCO, that instruction has to be done in a way that it is uh, relevance of knowledge to the community, to the person is different, right? And therefore, it should be approached different, differently. And that education should be relevant locally, individually, or personally. Now, to kind of unwrap that, if you think about, you know, we're going to Common Core or standards, think about, and, and this is his example, look at, at, at Earth Science, right? And so the, the, if, you're, if you're teaching in an online format, Earth Science, in a broad-based, one-size-fits-all, think about how students look at, at, at the environment from Boston, Texas, to Maine, to California, students are going to look at that to Alaska completely differently, right? And so the argument is then that not only is it by regionally, but it's, it's locally, that every person deals with instruction content, and it therefore should be done in a manner that is done locally and most relevant to the students. All right, so this study was using capture technology, and capture technology is kind of a broad-based term. It, it, it goes from um, video, to uh, screen capture technology. It's creating multimedia. And it's actually been around for a long time. Um, 2002, it's really creating movie segments with the ability to add audio messages. Um, and so the definitions that I've, I've kind of created here are, are skit, which is screen capture, instructional technology, which is the process. It's not just um, capturing your screen and talking into it. It's, it's the editing and the adding other information and 
I'll talk a little bit about the queuing and giving signals and information. That is the whole process in itself. Um, and then the, what, what the students, what the learners are, are, are pulling is screen capture of instructional multimedia. So multimedia is key in this study. All right, so what you can do with these two things, and I'll show you an example pretty soon. There are two, two separate realms this can go to, right? So, and I'll show you what the teachers are doing. You're creating a multimedia lesson. Um, it, it can either be used online, solely online, or it can be used in the blended classroom. Blended classroom, of course, you have face-to-face -face learning, you have the interaction, and you have this thing called blended multimedia instruction. So the first step in the three-step process, right? First thing you're going to do is capture the teacher's instruction. And, and the beauty of something like this is that you're keeping, for, for teachers, a, very, a lot of teachers are very intimidated with technology and online, but this is a uh, one of these uh, screens that you can use, digital screens that you can jerry rig a little bit. Um, you can make it so that you can talk into it, and I'll show you an example. But essentially what's happening is the teacher is keeping his or her pedagogy, right? This is the way that teachers, most teachers who lecture, are used to teaching with a board. So you don't have to deviate from the way that a teacher is typically creating instruction for the students. The only, the only thing is that it's being recorded, right? So one way is through those digital screens. Uh, the Khan Academy uses this type of technology a lot, right? They didn't invent this. A lot of people think they invented this. They just borrowed it. It's been around for a long time. Um, and then the other one that a lot of teachers use is uh, these little smart little video uh, cameras that they put on the desk. And, and so all three work. The first one that I showed you, uh, I think, has the, I've had the best results. So let me show you an example of what that looks like for a teacher to do. So she's talking into a microphone, right? I'm going to pause for a moment and do the math. If you want to pause at this time and also do the math, that would be great. And then you can check your answer. All right, so you can, you can see what the student is looking at. So this is a smart board. You can also do it on a tablet. So she did some of them at home on a tablet computer, as she, she did some in the classroom. But as I said, the nice thing about this is that you're not really asking the teacher to change a lot. Um, what I found is when you talk to a teacher about going online, they're very defensive. But when you say, listen, all we want to do is just capture just a small portion, the best part of your day's lesson, uh, most teachers think, oh, I, I can do that, right? So, so it's a very uh, easy way to transition. So then the second part, obviously, is to upload these. And we use Google Docs, and I think it's changed its name. But the, the great thing about that is when you do that, you don't have to necessarily teach one-to-one. -one. But you can make the students uh, the lessons available for recovery um, and for you know at home with the parents. So it's it's a it's a second step is getting it online. So the teacher doesn't say you're asking the teacher well you're going to now to teach this way, right? It is a, it is a measure along the way that is a very effective tool. If the teacher decides not to do one on one, this is still a, a very valid tool to have. Uh, and then the step three obviously is one on one computing where the students can access the lessons. And so this was all done. There's this term flipped. But this is not a flipped classroom. The flipped classroom, the students do it ahead of time. Uh, they create these lessons, and then they, they come to the classroom, and they've already run their content. This is not what this study is. Uh, we, do, we did a little bit of it, and we just, just to see what the students thought were. So one of the advantages, and we'll talk about this a little bit, is the uh, increased academic achievement, the pre preference, the uh, cognitive and psychological engagement. All right, so let's talk about the theoretical framework. There's a lot of research that has been done. And this, is, this research is really what um, differs and talks about why this works versus a stagnant online instruction. So the cognitive theory of uh, multimedia learning, uh, it, it basically has three different elements, dual coding, cognitive load, and active processing system. And so let me just describe that a little bit more detail. So dual coding, this is what multimedia instruction is all about, right? The idea is that we learn auditorily and visually. So, and, and the results show that, that students who, versus a reading textbook, versus multimedia, they, they learn better uh, at a higher rate. A cognitive load theory, right? And, and this is uh, research from. It doesn't mean two inches on the side, so we're going to put the 18 inches on the side. So she's talking into a microphone, right? I'm going to pause for a moment and do the math. If you want to pause at this time and also do the math, that would be great, and then you can check your answer. All right, so you can, you can see what the student is looking at. So this is a smart board. You can also do it on a tablet. So she did some of them at home on a tablet computer, as she, she did some in the classroom. But as I said, the nice thing about this is that 
you're not really asking the teacher to change a lot. Um, what I found is we talk to a teacher about going online, they're very defensive. But when you say, listen, all we want to do is just capture just a small portion, the best part of your day's lesson. Uh, most teachers think, oh, I, I can do that, right? So, so it's a very uh, easy way to transition. So then the second part, obviously, is to upload these. And we use Google Docs, and I think it's changed its name. But the, the great thing about that is when you do that, you don't have to necessarily teach one-to-one, -one, but you can make the students, uh, the lessons available for recovery um, and for, you know, at home with parents. So it's, it's, a, it's a second step is getting it online. So the teacher doesn't say, you're asking the teacher, well, you're going to now have to teach this way, right? It is, a, it is a measure along the way that is a very effective tool. If the teacher decides not to do one-on-one, -on -one, this is still a, a very valid tool to have. Uh, and then the step three, obviously, is one-on-one -on -one computing, where the students can access the lessons. And so this was all done. There's this term flipped. But this is not a flipped classroom. The flipped classroom, the students do it ahead of time. Uh, they create these lessons, and then they, they come to the classroom, and they've already gone to content. This is not what this study is. Uh, we do. We did a little bit of it, and we just just to see what the students thought were. So one of the advantages, and we'll talk about this a little bit, is the uh, increased academic achievement, the pre preference, the uh, cognitive and psychological engagement. All right. So let's talk about the theoretical framework. There's a lot of research that has been done, and this is this research is really what um, differs and talks about why this works versus a stagnant online instruction. So the cognitive theory of uh, multimedia learning, uh, it, it basically has three different elements, dual coding, cognitive load, and active processing system. And so let me just describe that a little bit more detail. So dual coding, this is what multimedia instruction is all about, right? The idea is that we learn auditorily and visually. So, and, and, and the results show that, that students who, versus a reading textbook versus multimedia, they, they learn better uh, at a higher rate. A cognitive load theory, right? And, and this is uh, research from uh, George Miller in 1956. And what it, what it says is that people can only retain a certain amount of inf information, which is seven plus or minus two at one time, right? And so strategies to overcome this is chunking, and people do all sorts of ways to get around this. But the research shows that you only have a limited amount of working memory, right? So if you're going to lecture for an hour, your students are not going to take that in, right? Um, and then the, the part that talks about what we're doing here with the teacher, the classroom teacher versus some canned online, is this whole idea of active processing system, right? Where students, they learn because it's, it's, um, it's their generative processing system. And, and so what the research says is students who uh, have a connection to the, to the teacher, instructor, will learn more. And I'll go that a little bit more detail. So the active processing system. So this idea is, is that if you can connect to these students in an online way, so if it's a classroom teacher, um, that people learn more when the information is about themselves, right? Uh, so if you're talking about instruction, content that relates to them versus some generic content. Um, uh, on, the term for, uh, for an instructor online is called a pedagogical agent. It's not my term, right? So a pedagogy agent is able to take all this information and, and essentially talk the students through this with something called signaling or cueing, where, where they're, uh, and I'll show you a brief lesson, where the teacher is saying, this is what you want to look for, and, and, and directing the students through a multimedia uh, lesson. And that was all the whole idea of, of, of an on-screen person. This is with uh, research about this whole idea of gesture which basically says that, this is obvious, that, that the earliest form of communication was done in gesture, right? And people have a connection and they learn from gesture. All right, so the research experiment that we did here, right? So the question was, my, my first question was really the academic outcomes, but my committee were really interested, are the students engaged? Like, you know, they may do better, but are they engaged, do they like it? And then um, the other thing that, that put me over the top was, uh, my committee wanted me to really look at the teacher lesson development and what that was all about. And how did the teacher, what happened when the teacher tried to do this? And did it change the, the instructional practices? Right, so, so what we're looking at here then is screen capture which versus a live lecture. So it was set up where it was a month long study where the, there was a, a live lecture class and an online class. Same content, same teacher, same materials. Uh, the participants, this was a high school, so we had 56 students, a comprehensive high school, uh, a little over 1,000 students. 
uh, we had a control group, it was about 24 students, which means they had the live lecture, and then we had the experimental group, the treatment group, which was the multimedia, and we had ethnicity, uh, 67 white, Hispanic, African American, uh, pretty typical Northern California for, for that area. Uh, the apparatus here. Um, the students we were very fortunate. Uh, we gave the students all iPads. Uh, so the students had the ability in the classroom. Uh, they didn't take them home, but they could watch them at home. Uh, the teacher used the smart board, the digital uh, smart board, and then we also had a, um, a, a digital laptop with the same technology so the teacher could, could go home if they wanted to. Uh, and then the lessons were uploaded to the Google Docs, which was the learning management system, essentially. And let me show you what that looked like. So this is about... Hello, I just finished recording your first lesson on Chapter 5, which is on factoring. And I realized after I recorded it that I'd like you to listen to this lesson one time through without taking notes. Because there are two different methods that I use for factoring, and I want you to be able to choose which method you prefer. So please listen to this first lesson all the way through. Don't take any notes, and decide which way you like to factor. Whichever way you choose is the way that you should put it in your notes. Don't forget to do the examples at the end, and good luck. Today we're going to begin our first lesson recorded on Chapter 5. We are going to do the sections on quadratic um, equations by factoring. So we're going to practice factoring quadratic equations. If I speak too fast, please pause it at any time. It is your responsibility to take notes and be able to do the examples that I give at the end of the lesson. So let's remind you what a quadratic equation is. I won't show you the whole thing, but you can just get a sense of what it is. So traditional pedagogy, the way the teacher normally teaches. A quadratic equation looks like this, y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are all numbers. The x squared in the problem tells us that this is going to be a parabola. It will not be a straight line, it will be a parabola. So most of the equations that we look at will have a zero here. And then all three of the terms must be on this side of the zero. Okay, so I think you get a sense of what's going on there, right? So the reason why it's not just called screen capture, um, because there's a multimedia, so the pedagogical agent, she introduced the lesson. She talked about what was what was important in the lesson. Uh, she did the exact same lesson to the live lecture class, right? So the instrument that we use, so this was a quasi-experiment, which means that we don't just arbitrarily be able to pick uh, randomly students. High schools are very hard to do research experiments. So it's a quasi meeting. There were two uh, classes already set up. It was through the areas randomly set up students, and we just picked from two of our classes randomly. Um, and so we did a pre-test, post-test, which means they did a test of, of what they were going to do in the uh, at the end of the study, in the beginning. Um, and I'll show you, we also compared their geometry scores. Um, they had an online journal, the students who were going online that they could, they could write, and they also at the end did a survey. Uh, it was a pretty lengthy survey. Uh, and then the uh, content was from the survey through a Likert scale, by point scale. Uh, materials used, we used the standard textbook, um, High School Algebra 2 material. Uh, there were no changes done. So the idea was we're not going to change the way you practice. We just want to we just want to capture what you're doing. So existing algebra, um, and you saw that the curriculum, it's algebra, quadratic equations, factoring. Uh, could be the square, just for traditional lesson that you normally do. So the design of this experiment uh, for a whole month, which is actually a long time for an experiment. Um, once there was no live lecture done, so in the in the experimental group, what she normally would do in a live lecture was done pre-recorded. Uh, they were, however, so what would happen is that the teacher would, uh, in, in, the, in the standard class, they, she would do her lecture, and then they would do workbook activities, and she would walk around and help them, and, and, and they would start their homework. So the only difference was, instead of live lecturing, when the students were watching the videos and the multimedia instruction, they had the worksheets. All she did was do one-on-one -on -one instruction the whole time. Right? She just went to student, when they raised their hand, student to student to student. Right? So her, her role was not of, of the, the standard delivery. It was more one-on-one -on -one instruction. Um, 
so they could get as much as they want. Uh, the only difference was that, that because it was an online format, the students were able to access the lessons at home or out of classroom. Right? They were there, they weren't told they had to, but they were there. Did you track if they did? We did, and it's interesting, well, the results. Um, so in the, the students then had to, at the end, they had to, had to talk about the, how they understood the lessons, the clarity lessons, there were a lot of questions they had asked, the pacing, how well it transitioned, and this was taken from Appleton's. This is a way to uh, find engagement. So engagement has, has different meanings to different people, but essentially the idea is that we're looking at the interaction of the material, uh, and then psychological engagement, I'll talk about that momentarily, and then there were open-ended questions. So we would ask them to, to one through five, the Likert scale, if there was a teacher going fast, if there was any material, and then we would then ask them to explain your answer. Um, so the other thing was the lesson development. So the teacher had to write daily. She had a, a form she had filled out, and then we, we did an interview at the end. What I found when we were doing the, uh, when she was filling out the daily uh, questionnaire was that she was telling me more than she was putting on there. So what we decided to do was to go back to the IRB, which is the Institutional Review Board, and ask them that we could do an uh, interview at the end, and, and they granted that. So there was an interview at, at the end. Uh, we use this uh, role of matrix, which is essentially write down all the data, and you look for commonalities uh, for the follow-up qualitative. So let's look at the results. Uh, so at the end of the four-week study, students increased their algebraic performance. And so this was what was called an ANCOVA. Uh, ANCOVA is this ability to take the pre-test and the co-test and find out um, what they're doing. And the reason why you do that is sometimes they'll get a repeater or somebody who can really skew the data. So if you just get a post-test, um, you know, you don't know that somebody's already known the material and really give you some outliers and, and, and mess up your data. So there are two, two ways we did it, just to confirm. One was the pre-test, post-test, uh, which is the top one. So you see that the students in the live lecture, their average score was a 70, which is a C, and in the uh, screen capture group, they were B. So that's an entire letter grade better. So the, the interesting thing was when we went and looked at their geometry, uh, geometry scores from the previous class they took, different teacher, we compared the results. And so they were, again, significant. Uh, as a way to factor as close to the pretest, we looked at the geometry scores, how well did they do compared to that. So we had two measures to show that they were actually, uh, uh, their achievement increased. And then we'll get into why that, that probably happened, the preference. So, you know, one of the questions, did you like this? And so the question here, if you read on the bottom, do you feel the online lessons improve your learning? So we asked that prior to the students having any scores, right? And so 87% of the, of the multimedia students felt that that the multimedia lessons improve their learning. And then we ask them why, and we'll get into that uh, shortly. But so that's a pretty significant amount of students that felt like it was working for them. Um, and then the question was, uh, let's see what this question was, if you had to learn the future, which you prefer, 80% said that they preferred. Um, and some of the reasons were it was hard focused because she talks fast. Um, and they get lost and get behind. And, and the other problem in the traditional classroom is everybody has to go at the same speed. Uh, the question was, do you want your student, your teacher to do this again? She didn't, uh, but the, it, was, it was pretty interesting to look at because the students not just checked the box, yes, but they were explanation marks, right? And you know how high school students can be kind of uh, enthusiastic. So they were 93%, uh, that's, a, that's a huge gain, right? And, and remember, we're not asking the teacher to really do all that different type of instruction. And this is, you know, this is proven. This is, this is quantitative data. Um, so one of the things that they said, um, here's a couple of questions. Uh, the, over the live, that we asked the, the live lecture, did you understand the material? Uh, and this was a, one through, through seven, or one through five, excuse me. The, the uh, multimedia students felt like they understood it. This was before they knew their, their results of their test. Um, and the reason why I did was it clear, was, was one of the questions uh, was, was the chapter five teaching clear and easy to understand. Um, the students in, in the multimedia group said yes. 
All right, so let's look at engagement. So according to Reed, if you look at engagement, it's really the behavioral intensity, the uh, active involvement during the task. That's one way to measure engagement. Uh, and we use this Appleton student engagement instrument, which, uh, so the, the quote from, from all their research, cognitive and psychological engagement, it's less observable, more internal indicators, such as self-regulation, relevance of schoolwork to future endeavors, value of learning, personal goals, and uh, autonomy. Um, and then we get into psychological engagement, which is different. It's about relationships, identification, and belonging um, with their teachers and peers. So two different types of engagement. So uh, it's called an SEI. Um, so measuring the control, so for example, uh, did they have control over their learning and relevancy? Uh, students felt they had a lot more control. Obviously, they, uh, they, they would. Um, how important was the material, significant, which, which is uh, looking at cognitive engagement. So, so this is a uh, SEI, this is a tool you can use to, to measure engagement. Both groups of students use this. So the cognitive level, they showed increased signs of being engaged. Uh, look at self-regulation. So for example, how many times did you pause each online lesson? And so what we found was that students were stopping at each class about two times during the class. So in each class period, they watched that lesson twice, and I'll show you the data. So each lesson, about 10 minutes long, they were watching twice, and then at home, they were watching about one and a half times. So each lesson, the content was being watched about three and a half times, which could be one of the factors why the students did better. Um, so some of the themes here, we're looking at themes, uh, what came about the students, uh, they were able to review as authors need, and, they, and this is what, what they did, they actually did review. Um, they were able to pause, most of, I think the most significant was that when you asked students what you liked about it, they said they could pause and rewind the lesson, and they could replay it. Uh, if you, so some of the things here, right, um, I could pause and rewind, but I didn't understand something where I missed it. Uh, if you miss something, you just have to skip it, or if you get lost or left behind, it's hard to catch up. Traditional classroom responses. Self-regulation. Um, so the interesting thing is, it was much more efficient and faster. Right? So you think that a student who's watching the content twice in the classroom, that it would actually go take longer in the classroom than a traditional live lecture. Right? So you think, well, if they're watching it twice, then, then the class you need more instructional time, right? They talk about this whole notion that uh, as, a, as a solution to our educational problems, we're going to extend the class day, right? So what I say to that is, what you're doing is you're taking bad instruction and you're just giving more bad instruction, right? So the reality is that you can compress the instruction in a much more efficient way. You don't have to extend the day by three hours, right? It's actually much more efficient and takes a shorter time. What would happen was the teacher in the multimedia class felt like she, she didn't know what to do in the live lecture because she, because the, the multimedia group were going so fast she found herself in all this dead time and she didn't think the kids were learning because she didn't know what to do. She had 15 minutes left of class, they'd already done the lessons, they'd done the worksheets, so they do homework, right? So she was really concerned and, and a little worried that they weren't actually watching this, but it turned out that they were. So. Um, Two times in the classroom, one and a half times at home, uh, and they're watching a much faster rate. Right, so they're going through the material in the classroom at a much faster rate. So let's look at these cognitive uh, engagement themes. Uh, a lot of students. It wasn't that they were sick or cutting class. They had sports. They had things. And the beautiful thing for the teacher was that she would just say, "Come on in. Uh, you can watch yesterday's lesson." She didn't have to reteach or say, "Sorry, you guys lost." Uh, it was all right there. Um, and she was in the class, if they had a question, she'd just go into the question. Um, and students talked about this feeling of autonomy, uh, independence. Um, they said, you know, we could miss instruction and still learn. And, and I'll talk about briefly, what that did was it created a, a much less stressful environment. If you look at traditional classrooms, especially in any accelerated, students are rushing to get material, and if they don't get it, they're, they're panicked, right? So it's, it was a much more, and students talked about this less stressful environment, because they knew if they didn't get the notes, they could just go back and get it. And algebra, if you guys know much about algebra, algebra tends to be one of those key classes where you look at where students go to college and succeed and they don't. Algebra is one of those classes that, that is a measure if students are going to be successful. Um, and so in this algebra class, students said, you know, you can miss instruction and still learn. 
I can catch lessons at home. If I was absent, uh, I could still learn. Psychological engagement. Um, so it enabled the teacher to provide more one-on-one -on -one instruction. It's actually all she did was one-on-one -on -one instruction. Um, the student responded, it felt like I had a personal teacher. Uh, seems like you're the only student. If I need doubts or questions, the teacher will instantly come to my aid. Um, I got to check, uh, the teacher would say I got to check more students for practice problems. Uh, one of the things she said, Johnny has a very low C, Johnny's not his name, of course, and he asked questions. He finally was able to say, I really don't understand this, we'll go with this. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of students uh, are very intimidated to ask questions in front of their peers or in front of their, 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 uh, their teacher. And so, in this environment, because everybody else had their headphones on, they could just raise their hand and nobody would hear them asking questions. So it really changed the dynamic of the classroom for these students. Um, all right, so one of the things we did, we did a couple flip where she said, go online, do it. Uh, see how you do. Students didn't like that. Um, and, and the question was, well, why, why you didn't? Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit, but, but one of the major responses was, there's nobody there to help me. Now, in theory, I guess you could have a teacher online, so when they're at home, they could just access her. But the reality was they were stuck, and they had nobody for assistance. So they did not like this flipped classroom. They, they enjoyed having the teacher there, so when they were stuck, they could raise their hand, the teacher was there. Mind you, this is only part of the class. It doesn't mean we're doing this for the entire hour-long class. It's just a small portion of the class. So students did not like 87% they wanted to watch the, with the teacher rather than at home. All right, so three things, I think there are five or six here. Um, they talked about an interesting thing here, their classmates. Uh, typical, I don't know about your classes, but I've, I've watched a lot of classes, you usually have a couple students who really disrupt the class, and there was none of that. Uh, no disruptive behavior. Students were very engrossed in what they were doing. Um, so the relationship with their peers changed. They found the classroom much more enjoyable. Um, if I don't understand any, if I don't understand something, I would go back and check without this. This is all students' quotes. Didn't really prompt them, just asked why. It wasn't asking anything directed in this, this way. Uh, go back without disrupting the pace of others. Uh, we can pause and ask questions without disrupting everybody else. We kept the classroom quiet, making it easier to focus. Um, the teacher also talked about it was a less uh, distracting environment uh, for the academically challenged students. Um, they were focused and there weren't uh, kids shouting in the background. So much easier to focus in this type of environment. Uh, one of the interesting things was, was that students were less afraid to ask questions. Um, you forget as an instructor that you do have students that are afraid. Um, and so the relationships changed, as I said. So these are from the students, right? They used to be nervous to ask questions in front of everybody. Uh, too afraid to ask teacher questions in front of the whole class because I don't want to look stupid. Um, I feel a little weird raising my hand. This is a teacher who's been teaching for 15 years. She never thought about this. Most people don't think that the students are actually apprehensive to ask questions. Um, but the, the other interesting thing that happened was because it was a different environment, the students would talk to their neighbor and say, hey, Billy, I don't know, did you get this? So there was collaboration going on. So the students would turn to another one and say, hey, I didn't get this, did you get this? So, so they were actually collaborating. Uh, teacher thought that was, that was pretty cool. All right, and then the last one here, uh, we didn't tell the parents, we didn't have to, because we weren't changing the instruction. We didn't have to have the parents sign off on this. Uh, part of the wishes we did, so the parents would have actually known what was going on, in that they could have helped their students, but the students uh, stated that they were watching them at home, and their parents were actually helping them with their instruction. So a great way for students who want to be doing tutoring with their students, all those instruction, today's lesson is there, the homework, they could, they could just go through. I don't know about you guys, but trigonometry algebra is a long time, and if I was teaching my daughter or my son, uh, knowing that I could watch the, the, the instruction group real quick it would certainly help. And that's what the parents were doing. Um, so that the parents were helping based, based solely on the instruction of the teacher. Uh, let's see what we have here. That's all the comments we made by so, so here's the uh, students talking about the video research study. These were not the students in the study. I've had, I like being able to take notes 
so that I could pause and rewind if I didn't understand something. Something like I had a personal teacher. With taking notes, I could pause them so I didn't miss anything. If we missed school, we could watch the lesson at home. When we do regular teaching, it is sometimes slowed by the teacher. pause and ask questions without disturbing anyone else. If I was absent one day, I wouldn't be behind. With taking notes, I could pause them so I didn't miss anything. It made it easier instead of someone asking a question in front of the whole class. That gives them time. The fact that I could go back and rewatch a video to prepare myself for the test if I didn't remember a lesson. If I'm absent, I can just go online and watch a lesson. Uh, I used to be nervous to ask a question in front of everybody. Alright, so we can get a sense of what's going on there. Alright, so then. Uh, I, my committee didn't think it was actually going to work, so they wanted me to really look at the lesson development. So there were some themes here. One of the things that, that I do have to say was the teacher, it did take a lot of time for her to do this. Um, she said it took an enormous amount of time, um, a lot of planning. Uh, so if you just tease that out a little bit and, and look at that, one of the reasons why it took so much time was this teacher who had been teaching the department chair for 15 years had never actually seen her instruction. Right? The way that she viewed how successful her instruction was, was by looking at test scores. She never looked at her instruction. So what happened was, if you just take away all the data about improvement and just use this as a way for lesson development, the teacher's able to analyze what they're doing. And so what the teacher did was, was every lesson they made, the teacher changed the way that she instructed. Um, and it was self-imposed. The teacher can do this live in front of the students as they're teaching and just record, but it was self-imposed. It took a long time because she realized that she didn't like the way that she was teaching. Um, so as I said here, so it was a new way for her to evaluate uh, her instruction. Um, as I said, the only way that she could assess her instruction was to look at the test scores, um, and she was able to really evaluate. So think about that, right? You can evaluate instruction before you're actually teaching. Um, if you've ever, uh, you know, people are trying to assess teachers, typically they do it after the fact. Wouldn't it be great if you could actually assess the teacher before the lesson, so then you could actually do something to improve that lesson, as opposed to say, well, next year we'll do better, right? So, so interesting way of assessing what's what's going and what's being instructed. Um, and, and again, these were not, you know, I, we really didn't know what was going to happen here. Um, it makes sense once you look at it, but you know, there's really not a lot of data on this. Um, so the technology, she, she, she redid it, right? Um, she, before, was much more concerned about covering a lot of material. But when she, she started doing this, she became much more concerned about the quality of her instruction. Uh, you know, she realized some of these lessons, she had to go back and redo it, 15-year teacher, right? Um, and it helped her with her errors. She realized that she'd been making mistakes. She could go back and fix them. Uh, so interesting thing happened here. The teacher decided to work with another, which is uh, another algebra teacher, which is, people want teachers to do that. She wasn't supposed to, but she found it as a great tool for collaboration, right? So she, she had another math teacher that she worked with and she said, hey, you know, uh, let's look at this. Uh, how am I doing? You know, how, well, how would you do this differently? So it was a great tool for collaboration um, and improving her instruction. Okay, so let's look at some. some broad topics here. So limitation here. Um, it would be better, of course, to do a longer study, a larger sample size. Uh, but this, this was more than adequate. Um, there's this whole notion of interactive effect from a pretest, meaning that the students might be able to remember the content. Uh, however, you know, if you look at algebra, it's very complicated. Students really can't remember that. And this whole notion of novelty effect, right? So the novelty effect is it's new technology, a lot of studies, right? Oh, it's cool, they're more engaged. But uh, what we did in the study is the control group had iPads also. They just used them for like math, uh, you know, as a calculator. So they did have the iPads in the classroom. It just was not being used for the live lecture. So that novelty really isn't quite the same. Um, and, and a month long duration, usually the novelty effect, no matter uh, first, first high school students, one of them learning and teaching is teaching. So that go, goes away pretty quick. So the implications for practice. Um, obviously improved lesson scores, uh, 11%. Uh, strong preference and engagement. Um, 
It's important to note that just because students like it and they're engaged does not mean that they're going to learn, right? So, so the instruction has to be done away but it's consistent with the way that, as I said, this whole cognitive tool that you're not overloading information, you're not creating a half, a, long, a half an hour long, you're standing up with a video camera. It has to be done in a way that minimizes the student's cognitive load. Right? So, it's, so it's a clean lesson, short, concise, um, and you're signaling and talking to your students. Audio, video. Um, so interesting thing about all this, it really comes full circle to this constructivist learning model. Um, where students are, are it's more student-centered than teacher-centered. Um, implications, it's much faster. As I said before, a lot of the solutions to our educational woes are to extend the classroom day. But what we're, what we're saying here in this study is, let's not do that. Let's just have better instruction and, and have the students do it in a more efficient way. Um, I need to wrap this up. Um, so, last part about this, it's important to understand that, that what we're talking about instruction is just one part of instruction. If you look at, 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 at uh, this is John Anderson, right? It's the declarative knowledge, which is just a small part of instruction. This is not a classroom where you just sit there and watch while they make instruction. The teacher's role is, is, uh, is that that's the cognitive skill. So, the teachers are getting the content, but the teachers, the students get the content, the teachers are able to say, this is what you do with this content. The role of the teacher is even more important in this setting. And then the students, in a, in a more of a project-based, they, they can reinforce that by doing. So it's one part of learning. I don't want to imply that this is the only part of classroom instruction. Uh, it's, a, it's a small part, but it, if you think about it, if you don't have that content, knowledge, no matter what you do to reinforce or have the students apply it, they are not going to succeed unless they actually have that content knowledge. Uh, and this is really through this uh, Anderson's adaptive control of thought that there's more than just the declarative knowledge. And what we're talking about here is declarative knowledge. So if you look at ways to apply knowledge, this is the, the seminal type of research for project-based learning, which is declarative, procedural, and contextual knowledge. And we're talking about declarative. The great thing is when we talk about more efficient use of class time is you can actually do these things where you're not running out because the bell just rang, right? I'm uh, just about done here. So teacher evaluation, right? What a great way to evaluate teachers. Not that teachers would really want this, but it is there. So your content, the way you teach is there, and before you instruct, the administrator can, can watch your instruction and say, you don't, you've not either mastered this, or I don't think this is the best strategy for your students. Um, and so before it happens, not after the fact. And it's also less stressful for a teacher, right? You're not sitting on there and playing games with your students to behave. Um, and, but however, this study did not do blended versus online. I wish it had, but this was blended versus live lecture. Um, how much impact is it, you know, the psychological engagement, that relationship with the teacher? Because here we're talking about at this conference online learning, you know, uh, with you know, K-12 and can learning, we're talking about how much is that psychological engagement with that teacher giving a lesson. Uh, interesting to try to tease that out and really, wh wh where is that? Um, and how much of that is really necessary? So there's a lot more things you can do here. Long-term effect in this environment. So there's still a lot of unanswered questions here. So really didn't adequately do the flipped classroom. It would be interesting to look at that. So, you know, uh, in class versus solely flipped classroom. It'd be a great experiment. I think we're here, uh, basically done here. Uh, as I said, I have so many references here that you would, uh, it goes for about 10 pages, and, and you can just go a lot of that. So if you're interested in looking at this, uh, this study is here at uh, Brideyes, and it's my last name, Smith, at HTML. You can certainly just email me uh, if you 